thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here in, uh, in Dublin. And uh, as you said, I'm going to talk about the case for monetary finance or, or, or money finance. Um, I usually spend my time at the moment uh, promoting my book, so I'll wave the book around and encourage you subliminally, there it is, it's subliminally, uh, to uh, read the book. It came out uh, in uh, last October. It's called Between Debt and the Devil. Uh, and I've just actually been around China uh, promoting a Chinese translation uh, of the book. And as many of you may know, the issue of debt in China uh, is one of the rather larger issues uh, in the global economy at the moment. Now, in this book, I set out a point of view about why the 2008 crisis occurred and even more about why the recovery from the crisis has been so slow and weak and difficult. Why, eight years after the crisis, we seem to need zero interest rates to keep the global economy uh, going, uh, why inflation has been below central bank uh, uh, forecasts, why the IMF keeps on bringing down its forecasts of global growth, uh, why its uh, January uh, this year uh, update of its World Economic Outlook was a entitled Subdued Demand and Diminished Prospects. So the book is about what is going on. And it ends with part five saying that what are we going to do to get out of uh, the situation that we're in? And it is in uh, that, uh, part five, that I made the case that we must consider the possibility of monetary finance. I didn't argue that we should definitely do it, but what I said is we should take it out of the taboo box where it has been for many years, because monetary finance is seen by central bankers as not just something that you shouldn't do, but something you shouldn't talk about, something which is, you know, slightly proves that you're socially not acceptable uh, at the fine tables of, of central banking. Now, that's what it says in part five, and that's what I'm going to primarily talk about uh, today rather than the totality of the book, this issue of the case for monetary finance. Uh, I also set it out, by the way, in a major a, a lecture I gave at the IMF uh, Jack Polak uh, Research Conference in November uh, last, and which will shortly appear in the IMF uh, Economic Review. And as a result of that, I've ended up with a bit of a name for being, along with Ben Bernanke and Willem Boiter, uh, one of the people who is proposing uh, helicopter money as part of the solution. And I'll explain exactly what I'm saying. But before I do that, I need to tell you a brief bit about the analysis of why we are in this situation, which is the rest of the book. So what I'm going to do is do a fairly brief run through the essential analysis of the book of what is the situation we are in and why, and then turn to the issue of how do we get out of it and uh, why that should include the possibility of monetary finance. If I were to try and sum up one fact above all, which explains why recovery from 2008 has been so difficult, it's this. This is the growth of private credit in all the advanced economies together from 1950 through to the crisis. And it's taken by a very fine article among several by Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff. And what it shows is that for all the advanced economies, private credit as a percent of GDP, so we're talking here about household and corporate, and this is non-financial, non-financial corporates, grew from about 50% in 1950 to 170% in 2007. And as you can see, it grew pretty much every year from 1950 to 2007 and at an accelerating pace after the 1990s. The vast majority of that growth in credit, moreover, did not do what our economic textbooks tend to suggest that bank credit does, which is fund, plant, and equipment a investment by uh, corporates. The vast majority of it funded real estate. And again, there's a very fine study which INET, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, has uh, helped uh, finance by three economists, Alan Taylor, Oscar Yorda, and Maurice Schullerich. And it's the results are in a very fine article called The Great Mortgaging. And what they have done is look at the banking systems and the US, the capital market credit system, of all advanced economies together, 17 they've looked at, back to 1870, and they've said how much of the lending is to real estate. 
Now, I would ignore the extreme volatility in the early 20th century. When you have world wars and hyperinflations, some pretty weird things happen to bank balance sheets. But the big story is that from 1870 through to about 1960, banks were lending about a third of their money to real estate, and that by 2007, that had risen to 60%. And the vast majority of that lending doesn't even fund new capital investment in real estate, though it does do that, and you had plenty of that in Ireland before 2008. The vast majority actually funds a competition between people for the ownership of real estate assets that already exist, either between people or uh, real estate investors. Now, the reason why this matters is that when you have lending primarily against existing real estate, and given that existing real estate is highly locationally specific, and a very large proportion of the value of that real estate resides in the locationally specific land on which the real estate sits, rather than the constructed value of the real estate, you are capable of creating these very strong upward cycles of more credit produces more real estate price increases, produces more credit, produces more real estate prices increases. And I explore in the book why that occurs. They are a, a, a cycles which were well explained by some economists who were completely outside the mainstream before 2008. I think in particular of Hyman Minsky, uh, who probably more than any economist was warning us about the dangers of credit and asset price cycles, uh, but who as a result was almost entirely ignored by the rest of the economics profession. We get these incredibly strong cycles of credit and real estate in the upswing until there is a break of confidence and then it swings down in the other direction. And if that break in confidence occurs when the debt level is already high, what we enter is a situation where the debt doesn't go away. It simply moves around the economy and where it appears that all our classic levers to stimulate aggregate nominal demand are blocked, imperfect, or have adverse side effects. What do I mean by the debt doesn't go away, it simply moves around? Well, let me illustrate what I mean by reference to Japan. Japan in the 1980s has one of the biggest credit and real estate booms the world has ever seen. Uh, bank lending against real estate goes up something like two and a half times in five or six years. Real estate prices in central Tokyo, central Osaka go up by four times in five or six years. Then there's a crack of confidence and the real estate prices come down by 70% or so. And what you then have is a whole load of companies, and in Japan's case, it was primarily companies rather than households, but it can be households as well that drive this effect. You have a whole load of companies in Japan who then feel themselves over-leveraged. And feeling themselves over-leveraged, they become determined to pay down their debt and to reduce their leverage. And they become determined to do that even when the Bank of Japan cuts the interest rate to zero. Because, as is beautifully described in a very good book about the Japanese experience by a man called Richard Koo on balance sheet uh, recessions, once companies feel they are over-leveraged, they are not very sensitive in behavior to low interest rates. They are still determined to deleverage. And you can see their determination to deleverage in this line here. This is the sectoral financial surplus or deficit of the Japanese private non-financial corporates. And as you can see, back in 1990, they are big borrowers from the rest of the economy or from the rest of the world. They are borrowing about 9 or close to 10% of GDP. They then become determined to delever, and they switch from being net borrowers to net depositors, net savers in the system as they attempt to deleverage. And they spend the next 25 years essentially attempting to deleverage. Now, what happens as a result is that they cut investment and households cut consumption, and that drives the economy into a recession, and that drives the public deficit to go the other way because tax revenues goes down and social expenditures go up. And you can see the public deficit going the other way in the government line here, which up until 1990 was a small surplus, and then it turns into a large deficit where it has been uh, ever since. And those deficits were naturally arising and to a degree helpful. If the Japanese government had not run large deficits to offset the deleveraging of the private sector, Japan would probably have suffered not just 
two decades of very slow growth and slow deflation, but a real 1930-style Great Depression. So they were useful, but they have an inevitable consequence that public debt as a percent of GDP goes up. And if we switch from this chart, which is flows, to the next chart, which is stock, the stock of debt as a percent of GDP, you can see that the story of Japan for the last 25 years is that there has been a long, slow, steady deleveraging of the private sector, offset by a more than offsetting increase in the debt of the public sector, which has gone from about 50% of GDP to about 250% of GDP and still rising. The debt hasn't gone away. It has simply moved around the economy. And that pattern is precisely what has been repeated across the advanced economies since 2008. If we look at all the advanced economies together, uh, what you will see here is the final step of that 50-year run-up of private debt, 150 up to 170, uh, which you saw on the first chart, accompanied at the time with public debt roughly constant, then the attempted post-crisis deleveraging of the private sector. In this case, the most important part of the deleveraging is the US household sector. These are over-leveraged US uh, households, which are determined to pay down their debt and get their balance sheets back under control, but a much more than offsetting increase of the debt of the public sector. So if you put the two together, the overall story for advanced economy debt, public and private combined, is the top blue line on this chart. And as you can see, it hasn't gone down at all. It's gone up and up and up. Public and private debt together has just relentlessly uh, increased. And this has been beautifully set out in a wonderful report with the great title, Deleveraging What Deleveraging? Because at the level of all debt together, there has been no deleveraging. What there has also been, though, is a very significant shift of at least maybe there's been a slight slowdown of the increase in the developed world, but there's been an extraordinary takeoff of debt in emerging markets. And the most dramatic of those is China, where Chinese debt to GDP, primarily corporate, has gone up from about 140% of GDP to about 240% of GDP. And again, that increase in Chinese debt isn't just coincidental. It isn't just that the advanced economies had a financial crisis, and quite by chance, at the same time, the Chinese economy decided to uh, increase its leverage. The one caused the other. The Chinese authorities in two th early 2009 were terrified that deleveraging by US households in particular was going to drive a falling demand for Chinese exports, that that was going to slow economic growth and employment growth in China. And to offset that, they decided that they had to unleash an enormous investment boom, which was entirely credit financed. So what we keep on getting is once you've got a huge amount of debt, the debt doesn't go away. It simply moves around the economy. And we then seem to be stuck in a situation where our traditional policy levers are blocked. The classic initial policy lever, as we saw with Japan there, is to run what I call a funded uh, fiscal deficit, which I mean a fiscal deficit which is actually funded with the issue of interest-bearing debt. And in the immediate aftermath of the crisis of 2008, everybody agreed that that's what we should do. So that in April uh, 2009 in London, the G20 leaders all agreed that it would be good if all the major economies ran debt-financed fiscal deficits to offset the deleveraging of the private sector. And there's no doubt at all that the first round effect of that initially is stimulative to the economy. But after a while, you start worrying about the impact of that on long-term debt sustainability. You start worrying about uh, that increase in the uh, public debt level, which in aggregate we can see uh, on the blue line there. And so we get people saying, well, no, you can't go on with that. You've got to have fiscal austerity. You've got to have fiscal consolidation. We've got to get the public sector debt under control. But if the public sector attempts to get its debt under control and pay that down, while the private sector is still also deleveraging, then you can drive the economy into a deeper recession. Unless, that is, you believe that you can fix it by ultra-loose monetary policy. And the conventional wisdom 
of the last five years has been governments can take tighter fiscal stance, but central banks can fully offset that with ultra-loose monetary policy, reducing interest rates to zero or even negative, uh, using quantitative easing to bring down the long term of the end of the yield curve as well as the short end. The trouble with that is that though it's better than nothing, and let me be clear, if I'd been on the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee, I would have voted for the QE and the close to zero interest rates that we've had in the UK. Although it's better than nothing, the transmission mechanism through to the real economy is highly uh, imperfect. Because once interest rates are already low, further reductions of interest rates do not tend to stimulate uh, a big upsurge in investment demand. If by the latest round of QE, in the ECB's QE, uh, the bank manages to drive German 10-year bond yields down from 20 basis points to zero basis points, say, there aren't really German companies which are suddenly faced with a 20 basis point reduction in the cost of funds going to start investing. Investment is just not that uh, interest rate sensitive, in particular if debt levels are very high. So people then say, oh, no, no, that's not how um, a, a quantitative easing works. It works through asset prices. You drive down uh, long-term bond yields, equity prices go up, bond prices go up, people feel a bit richer. But again, that's a very indirect mechanism through to uh, the real economy. And it has the perverse effect of increasing inequality. And one of the things that I explore in my book is that one of the reasons why we may have created too much credit in the first place is because we are increasingly unequal societies. And then people say, oh, no, it works through another uh, a lever entirely. It works through currency devaluation. And indeed, if you listen to the speeches of Kuruda-san in uh, Japan or of Mario Draghi, they often are focused on uh, using a, a loose monetary policy to bring down the value of the yen or the euro. But it just obviously, mathematically, axiomatically the case that at the global level, that has to be a zero-sum game. It is a tool which can be used to help one country which has a debt overhang problem escape from it, but the world cannot escape a global debt overhang by devaluing its currency against those of other planets. And if the Japanese government manages to bring down uh, the yen, the Japanese central bank manages to bring down the yen, that is then immediately a problem for Korea, for China, for the eurozone, which then, if it brings down the euro, is creating a problem uh, for the US. So we seem, as a result, to be stuck in a world with a sort of unavoidable choice. We seem as if we're going to end up with sustained low growth and low inflation with debt burdens which never decline but simply move around the global economy. Or we're going to have large-scale debt write-offs and restructurings, but actually it turns out in economic history to be pretty difficult to have large-scale debt write-offs, large enough to make a significant difference to the leverage of the whole economy without that itself being disruptive and depressive effect on the economy. Or we just stay forever with large debts which are made affordable with ultra-low interest rates, but those ultra-low interest rates are also creating incentives for people to create more debt. So again, we never create, uh, escape the debt. We therefore seem to be, as people are increasingly saying, out of ammunition. The phrase out of ammunition is frequently used uh, now. And uh, central bankers often uh, give lectures about we mustn't uh, expect too much of them. You know, they're poor, hardworking, worn down people doing their best. But we really uh, mustn't uh, put the whole burden of the world uh, on them. Now, the crucial point that I then make in part five of the book is that if our problem is inadequate nominal demand, if that is the problem, it might not be the whole problem, but if the problem is inadequate nominal demand, then banks and central banks and governments together never, ever run out of ammunition. Because if that is the problem, that you just don't have enough demand in the world economy, you can always fix it by central banks running, uh, providing money which finances increasing fiscal deficits. Now, the moment you say that, 
you've proved yourself a very dangerous person. And I think when I began to say it, I was worried that some of my uh, central bank governor friends around the world, you know, they wouldn't quite look me in the eye. They were, sort of felt I'd broken uh, ranks. But I have to say, if I have turned myself into uh, a radical, I, I am in pretty good company uh, because uh, here's some people who've argued for monetary finance before. And I have to tell you, they are not a swivel-eyed, um, extreme socialist inflation lovers. Uh, Henry Simons, one of the founding fathers of the Chicago School of Economics, strong believer in close to zero inflation, argued in 1936 that the way to control the price level and make sure that it didn't go up too fast or uh, uh, contract too slow was expand and contract issues of actual money. Monetary rules should be implemented and in turn should largely determine fiscal policy. A million miles away from the modern orthodoxy that there must be no integration at all between fiscal and monetary policy. Milton Friedman in 1948, this is in a different article than his famous helicopter money article, said government expenditures in a system which gave us stability would be financed exclusively by tax revenues or by the creation of money. The chief function of the monetary authority should be the creation of money to meet government deficits and the retirement of money when the government has a surplus when it wants to slow down the economy. Again, the chief function of the monetary authority should be the creation of money to meet government deficits. Uh, this is not Jeremy Corbyn. This is Milton Friedman. And you can see on Ben Bernanke's <coughs> advice to the Japanese government in 2003, he said, you are stuck in such a deep deflationary trap that you should consider a tax cut for households and businesses that is explicitly coupled with incremental BOG purchases of government debt so that the tax cut is, in effect, financed by money creation. So there is a good set of people who've argued for this. Let me make the case. First of all, let me clarify what we mean by monetary finance. They are increased fiscal <coughs> deficits financed by permanent money creation. They can come in lots of different ways. The central bank could directly credit the government's current account. The government could issue interest-bearing debt, which the central bank purchases, and then writes off and converts to a non-interest-bearing, irredeemable, due from the government, a security. Uh, option three is the government issues interest-bearing debt, which the central bank purchases, and permanently rolls over, permanently receiving from the government interest, which it, however, then automatically sends back to the government as central bank profit. These are all just technically different ways of doing it. All of them result in the fact that at the consolidated public sector balance sheet level, uh, there is, on the liability side, a non-interest-bearing, irredeemable money uh, rather than interest-bearing debt. Uh, as for how you spend the money, you can spend it in a whole series of ways. You can uh, do what people think of when they talk about a helicopter money drop, which is send 1,000 euros to every single uh, citizen. You can do it as a tax cut. Uh, that tax cut could be one year or it could be over several years. Uh, you could use it in order not to increase the taxes you were otherwise going to increase, or you could use it to fund a public expenditure program. There are an infinite variety of the ways that you do it, but all of them amount to running a fiscal deficit which is not financed with the issue of interest-bearing debt, which you have to pay back, but which is issued with a, 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 is met with irredeemable fiat money. Now, in my paper to the IMF, I argued that if this is how we define monetary finance, then it should be part of our available tools because four propositions exist. Four propositions are valid. The first is that there exist circumstances in which it is appropriate to stimulate aggregate nominal demand. And what I put here is the strength of the argument for each of these propositions. Um, and as you can see, this is the one that I've actually put the question against. Because I think it, it is the case, but it is dependent on particular circumstances. Sometimes it's appropriate to stimulate nominal demand, and I think those circumstances exist today. But it's not always the case. But these three propositions are, I believe, theoretically true and absolutely true. Monetary finance will always stimulate aggregate nominal demand. In some circumstances, it will do so more certainly and with less side effects than available alternative policies. And crucially, 
the degree of stimulus can be controlled. We're not in a situation where you start doing this and whew, suddenly you've done too much. You can decide to do a little or a lot. Let me just run through those four propositions. The orthodoxy today is that proposition number one definitely exists. Because after all, that's why central banks are running zero and negative interest rates policies. If you, if you don't believe that number one exists, that you don't believe that number one is true, um, then the Federal Reserve shouldn't have a Fed funds rate of a quarter percent and the ECB uh, shouldn't have a repo rate of a minus. These are attempts to stimulate uh, aggregate nominal demand. That is, however, being challenged by people in Germany. I think increasingly, as I listen to German economists, they are not arguing against ECB policy as being the wrong policy to achieve a higher rate of inflation or a higher rate of aggregate nominal demand growth. They are challenging whether that is a good idea at all. They are increasingly saying, what's wrong with mild deflation? What's wrong with an economy in which nominal demand doesn't grow? Now, I have engaged with them. I've been over to Frankfurt and Munich arguing about this. I think they're wrong. Uh, but I actually think it's the, as I say, I think it's the one of these which is most debatable, whereas I think the following three are not debatable at all. But why do I think it's wrong? Well, modern economies work best, I believe, with adv rich advanced economies with nominal GDP growth rates of something like 4 or 5% per annum, uh, enabling you to combine... 2 percent 2 real growth in line with uh, productivity growth at the frontier of technology, and inflation of about 2%. I am part of the orthodoxy that believes that 2% inflation is better than zero. If you put those two together, you want to have nominal demand growth running at 4 or 5%. And since the crisis, it hasn't been doing anything like that. In the US, nominal GDP has been growing at 2.9% per annum. In the UK, at 2.4% per annum in the EU at 1% per annum, and in Japan at uh, minus 0.1% per annum. And I think, I'm not going to argue it in detail here, but I argue uh, in the book and in the paper, that part of the problem of what's wrong with the Japanese economy, actually quite a lot in Japan's case, is inadequate nominal demand growth, and that quite a lot of the problem in Europe is inadequate nominal demand growth. Now, that doesn't exclude the possibility that there might be lots of other things wrong as well. There's no either or between supply side measures and structural reform and, and demand side measures. But part of the problem that we have in the global economy is a chronic deficiency of aggregate nominal demand. And that is showing up in the complete failure over the last four years of the Eurozone to meet its targets. The ECB has a target of keeping inflation close to, but a bit below 2%, and it's nowhere near. It has been falling for the last four years, and it is now negative, and inflationary expectations are coming down. So I believe there is a clear case for stimulating aggregate nominal demand. My second uh, proposition, Proposition 2, is that if you want to stimulate aggregate nominal demand, money finance will always stimulate it. What is money finance? It is a fiscal stimulus. Let's be clear, it is a category of fiscal stimulus. You cut taxes or you give somebody a one-off tax cut or you increase public expenditure, but it is not financed by debt. And therefore, there is no possibility of what is called a Ricardian equivalent effect in which the people who receive the tax cut say, ah, I know I've been given this tax cut, but I know I'm going to pay back the debt in future, so I'm not going to spend it. That is the great debate in economics as to whether debt finance deficits do or do not stimulate the economy, is whether there is or is not Ricardian equivalence. But what we know for certain is that when you do money finance, there is no Ricardian equivalence. It will definitely have a stimulative effect. In technical terms, and I explore this in my IMF paper, you achieve an increase in household nominal net worth when you do a uh, money finance tax cut, and you have an asymmetric effect on the private and public balance sheets. Household gross nominal wealth increases, but there is no increase in the net present value of public sector liabilities. Or to think of it simply, 
In Milton Friedman's helicopter money terms from his 1960 article, you fill a helicopter up with money, you scatter it down, people pick it up, they feel themselves richer in nominal terms, and they will spend it, and the process of spending it will either produce an increase in real output, if there is an output gap and a possibility of real output growth, or it will produce an increase in inflation, but in some way it will stimulate nominal demand. And I think it's as simple as that. And that then has a very clear consequence, which is if that is correct, and I am convinced that those propositions are correct, inadequate demand, deflation, or what the IMF called lowflation, are policy choices. They are never unavoidable effects. Faced with inadequate nominal demand, governments and central banks never run out of ammunition. So the statement that we are out of, if you think the problem is inadequate nominal demand, the statement we are out of ammunition is wrong, just wrong. Uh, it is not technically supportable in any way. Monetary finance will always stimulate monetary demand, and in some cases it will do it when the other things don't work. There are people out there in the world who are saying, and you know, I talk to them, people like Larry Summers or Paul Krugman, who get pretty close to saying, well, why complicate it? And why upset people by breaking the taboo? You know, why encourage the Federal Reserve to do something which will just bring the Tea Party down on its head uh, by talking about money finance deficits? Why don't we just do debt finance deficits? And you see articles from Larry Summers and Paul Krugman arguing for much bigger fiscal deficits in the US, in the Eurozone, financed in the classic fashion by uh, debt finance. And if you believe that there is no Ricardian equivalent effect, right? if you believe that people do not anticipate uh, the future debt servicing burden from higher debt, then they will be as stimulative as money finance deficits. But you can still say money finance deficits in their stimulative effect are greater than or equal than debt finance deficits. They're equal if there is no Ricardian equivalence. They're greater if there is Ricardian equivalence but they are definitely greater than or equal in their effect. How do they compare with forward guidance to influence expectations? I'm increasingly convinced that all this forward guidance stuff of central banks has become a sort of absurd cultish activity of very little meaning. I mean, today in Washington, Janet Yellen will give a, 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 a press conference, and people will try and work out whether the FOMC statement has moved the comma uh, forward or back, what has it said about uh, uh, whether they are, you know, the balance of risk is in some incredibly minor fashion. It's like sort of 1950s Kremlinology, where we used to try and work out from where people were placed on the podium as to what was going to happen to Soviet policy. I simply don't think it has a real economy effect. I, I think it, it's not effective. Uh, in the absence of real uh, actions. It's more certain than quantitative easing. I talked earlier about how quantitative easing works through uncertain and indirect transmission channels. And as for sustained negative interest rates, I think we are increasingly learning that when you go through zero, some very odd things happen to the economy because of nominal contractual liabilities, uh, debt contracts that don't automatically adjust. But even if negative interest rates do work, and negative interest rates, for instance, is what Ken Rogoff argues for, I think they can only work by re-stimulating the very growth of private credit that got us into this mess in the first place. If our fundamental problem is that we have too much debt in the world, it's pretty odd to suggest that the only way out is something whose transmission mechanism is through encouraging people to take on more private debt. So I believe that monetary finance can be in many circumstances, superior or more certain on its impact on nominal demand or have less adverse side effects. The final point is the degree of stimulus can be managed. And this is the most technically complicated bit of monetary finance. In a lot of the literature, in, for instance, um, Milton Friedman's 1948 article, Actually, he makes life easy for himself by imagining in a world which doesn't have fractional reserve banks and in which, therefore, the money supply is equal to the monetary base, where you literally hand out money 
and that money is either held as notes and coins or it is held at 100% reserve banks. If that was the world in which we operated, I think it would be pretty easy to understand that if you did, in the US economy, a one-off drop of 10 million new money supply, you would have an impact so small you would hardly see it. 10 billion, you'd have a appreciable impact. And 10 trillion, you probably would produce uh, extreme excessive inflation. The amount of the stimulus would depend on the amount of the money that you put into the uh, economy. Um, the only reason why that might not be the case is if, when you said you were putting in 10 billion, everybody thought that that was a signal that you're going to do it again and again and again and increase the dose. Because if that occurred, you might have an uncontrollable mechanism working through expectations and working through the exchange rate. So the management of expectations is key. But as long as you can make credible, credible commitments about how much you're doing and how much you will do in future, uh, then there is fundamentally the impact is proportional to how much you do. And it's a pretty fundamental common sense proposition. It does get much more complicated when we have fractional reserve banks. Because when you have fractional reserve banks, the money that the central bank creates is not ultimately money supply in the sense of notes and coins. It is monetary base in the form of commercial bank reserves at the central bank. And this is the most difficult issue in calibrating the effect of monetary finance, that you do a monetary finance operation, you give the uh, uh, commercial banks reserves, the first round effect is exactly as if you were in a, uh, a, a no fractional reserve bank uh, uh, world, you get a moderate stimulus to start with, but then somewhere down the line, the commercial banks use their reserves to lend out more money. And they create more private money on top of the public money uh, that you have created. That is the essential, but it is the only difficult issue with the calibration of monetary uh, demand. And there are solutions to it. The solutions are that you impose in future quantitative reserve requirements on the banks, essentially to stop them taking the first order effect of a monetary finance operation and multiplying it by the creation of private money. And the other thing you have to do is having imposed those uh, requirements on the banks, you have to make them non-interest bearing, because if they aren't non-interest bearing, uh, you haven't funded the public deficit with non-interest bearing uh, money. And again, my uh, article, my uh, paper for the IMF explains that. My conclusion from all of that, and this is what I'm going to assert, and you're going to have to somewhat accept it because I've run through uh, the technical details quite quickly, uh, but uh, you can read it in more detail either in the book or the article. I believe that there are no valid technical reasons at all for excluding money finance from our policy toolkit. It will always stimulate nominal demand, and it is technically possible to manage the degree of stimulus. But I accept that there are great political risks that if we first break the taboo, <coughs> then monetary finance might be used to excess. So I think there is a respectable argument on monetary finance that says even though monetary finance is technically feasible and in some circumstances the best policy, we should exclude its use entirely in order to avoid political risks. If somebody faced with my argument says, that's my position, and that is the position of, for instance, uh, uh, Otmar Issing, with whom I have uh, debated this, then I respect that point of view, because it's at least logical. I don't agree with it, because I think we can constrain the political risks, and I don't agree with it, because I think we might be in such a deep deflationary trap that we need this tool. But I think this is a respectable argument Whereas I think all the arguments that it's somehow technically impossible, 
or that it's bound to produce hyperinflation, I think are put forward by people who haven't done the homework to think it through. I think this is completely technically possible. I think there are major political risks. And that, of course, is what history tells us. When I give this lecture in Germany, um, if I don't mention Weimar, someone mentions Weimar. Um, and here on the right-hand side, you have Weimar. Uh, this is a, a sort of kid in, uh, sometime in 1923 having fun uh, making a sort of uh, construction out of uh, blocks of a, a, a Reichsmarks. I think each of these has sort of 500 notes. They're probably a million each. And when she's stopped enjoying uh, building this, uh, she's going to put it all in a wheelbarrow and buy a loaf of bread. So clearly, you can have an unsuccessful uh, and excessive use of monetary finance. But the chap on the left is Takahashi. Takahashi was the finance minister of Japan in 1931 through to 35. He very successfully used monetary finance to pull uh, Japan out of a recession more rapidly than almost any of the major economies. He was a very responsible person who in 1935 decided to end that and said, we, we, we're now back to normal rates of inflation. We don't need to do it anymore. And we're going to stop it and return to balanced budgets, uh, et cetera, and non-monetary finance. Unfortunately for him, at that stage, the military assassinated him uh, because they wanted to go on printing money uh, to fund their militarism. Uh, he wasn't a militarist, but we can't blame the technical policy uh, for the unfortunate end to which Takahashi came. His policy in itself was responsible. And actually, the essential point was summed up by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. In the 18th century, the Pennsylvania colony, one of the English colonies in uh, uh, East Coast of America, very successfully used monetary finance to keep the economy uh, going. But as Adam Smith pointed out, the success of money creation in Pennsylvania was dependent on the moderation with which it was used. Whereas exactly the same expedient was deployed by several other American economies, but for want of this moderation, produced much more disorder than conveniency, i.e. it produced excessive inflation. This is a tool where the result depends on how much you do, and in technical terms, you can decide how much to do, so the crucial issue is the political risk. The issue, therefore, is can the political risk of the overuse of monetary finance be managed? I believe it can. I believe it would be possible for us to establish a regime in which we hand to independent central banks pursuing the inflation target. We give them the authority to decide how much monetary finance will be allowed in a particular year in pursuit of the inflation target. Now, I don't think central banks can decide precisely how to spend money, because that has distributional consequences which are properly the domain of elected governments. But you can have a mechanism where you divide the responsibility between the independent central bank with an inflation targeting mandate, has the absolute authority to say there will be 30 billion and no more. And we believe that in this environment, 30 billion of money finance is a better way to get up to the inflation target than going more and more negative interest rates. I believe that such regimes could be put in place. And indeed, this is exactly the sort of regime which Ben Bernanke argued for two weeks ago in a Brookings Institute blog, uh, where he uh, said pretty much exactly the same thing. So I think the UK Monetary Policy Committee between 2009 to 12 could have been given the authority to say, we'd rather not do 375 billion of supposedly reversible QE. Instead, we think there should be a somewhat smaller amount of additional f fiscal stimulus permanently financed with central bank money. Now, that's my technical case and my case of why I think we can politically manage this. Let me end with two points about real world implications in the two major economies where nominal demand has been most deficient and therefore where the case for a nominal demand stimulus is greatest, in Japan and the Eurozone. And what I want to say on Japan is we are going to see monetary finance, whether you like it or not, and in some sense we are already. Because I want to assert 
that there are two realities about Japan that have to be accepted. One is Japanese government debt is never going to be repaid in the normal sense of the word repay. It's mathematically impossible. It's not going to occur. And secondly, that the Japanese government bonds which have been bought by the BOJ are never going to be sold back to the market. Let me support the first of those assertions by just showing you some interesting scenarios from the IMF fiscal monitor, which comes out each year. In November 2010, the IMF fiscal monitor said, we're going to run a scenario which shows what the Japanese government will have to do to get back to debt sustainability. And they defined debt sustainability as 200% gross debt to GDP by 2030, 80% net debt after the debt which is owned by the Social Security Fund. And they said, what's going to happen is that at present, uh, they're running a 6.5% uh, fiscal deficit. They're going to turn that into a 6.4% surplus by 2020, and they're going to maintain that surplus at that level throughout the 2020s. You go through to October 2014, and they said, well, we don't seem to be making much progress in turning this fiscal deficit into a fiscal surplus, but what we're now going to do is between 2014 and 2020, we're going to go from a fiscal deficit of 6% to a fiscal surplus of 5.6%, and we're going to maintain that throughout the 2020s, and we're going to pay down the debt. Well, by last year, 2015, reality had set in, and there was no longer any scenario which suggested debt sustainability, because it got just silly to keep asserting it. So rather than asserting what had to happen for debt sustainability, they said what was going to occur, which is that even by 2020, the Japanese uh, government is going to continue to run uh, deficits and is going to continue to pile up debt. That debt is being bought by the Bank of Japan. The Bank of Japan is buying Japanese government debt at the pace of 80 trillion yen of debt per month. The Japanese government is issuing debt at the pace of about 40 to 45 trillion yen per month. The share of Japanese government debt, which is owned by the Bank of Japan, is therefore relentlessly increasing. And there will be a date somewhere in the early 2020s where there is no Japanese government debt, which is not owned either by the Japanese Social Security Fund, which is an arm of the government, or by the Bank of Japan. There will be no debt owed to the external private sector. Somewhere along that path, market analysts are increasingly going to quote a figure which is Japanese net-net debt, I Japanese net debt after everything which is owned by things that the Bank of Japan owns. Because normally with a company, when you work out your consolidated balance sheet, uh, you don't include the debt to you or from you of things that you own. Japanese consolidated government public sector debt is in relentless decline. This is, in a sense, monetization without admitting as much. But because it's not admitted, the Japanese government is still telling the Japanese people day after day that they face this huge future debt burden and that they're going to have to pay it back and there'll have to be a sales tax increase next year and tight control of over public expenditure. It's simply not going to happen. Sometime this year, reality is going to set in. The sales tax increase is probably going to be delayed and should be. And Japan may also do what is called a voucher distribution, which is the nearest thing to helicopter money that there is. And don't worry about it. It's OK. The value of it is it's going to change the nature of the debate as it applies to a far more important and more worrying situation, which is the Eurozone. I'm actually not all that worried about Japan. Japan has a sort of giant accounting entry problem as to whether this debt is real debt or not. But Japan is one of the richest countries on earth. It is an ethnically and religiously, culturally homogeneous society with very little uh, immigration flows. It has low unemployment. It's a rich country, slowly getting richer. It faces some challenges, but those challenges do not include uh, challenges to social and political cohesion. The Eurozone, I think, is in a far more troubling state. I think this Eurozone and Europe in general, if we have there a decade or another decade of economic performance as poor as it was 
in Japan in the 1990s and 2000s, the social and political consequences in Europe are far more serious than the social political consequences in Japan. Because Europe is a country of many nations which are capable of getting into political disagreements with one another. It is a country with large, imperfectly integrated ethnic and religious minorities. It is a country with large, high levels of unemployment, and it is a country facing potentially uncontrollable immigration flows which are going to make that unemployment worse. If Europe doesn't manage to get its economy going again and deal with its debt burdens and grow nominal GDP at a reasonable rate, I think it is playing with social and political fire on a very, very dangerous basis. I think it is therefore more important in the Eurozone than in Japan that we take the possibility of monetary finance out of the taboo box and consider whether it is part of the policy armory that could help our problems. Unfortunately, I think the chances of that happening are very, very slight. Because there's a real difference between doing monetary finance in a classic one country, one government, one central bank polity and in a eurozone. In a one country, one central bank, one government, when you do monetary finance, you don't get complicated, or not too complicated, distributional issues. Right? If the Bank of Japan and the government of Japan agree to write off the debt that the government of Japan owes the Bank of Japan, everybody agrees that the only people involved in that are the people of Japan. But you try and do the same in the Eurozone, and you will get the German taxpayer saying, why are you writing off the debt of the Greeks or the Italians who should have paid this back debt in the first place? You end up with distributional arguments which get in the way of the necessary policy. So I'm afraid my belief of what is going to happen on the Eurozone, and this is my final slide, is as follows. I think that what ought to happen in the Eurozone is that the Eurozone is an imperfect monetary union which should progress to a much greater degree of federalization with significant debt relief. Let's be clear, there's got to be much bigger debt relief for Greece. If you think Greece is ever going to repay all its debts, you just haven't been looking at the numbers. It's just not going to occur. There's going to be either a default or a controlled restructuring of Greek debt. There should be federalization, there should be debt relief, there should be some categories of money finance, fiscal stimulus, if you did that, I think there could be a significant economic recovery. I put the probability of that at less than 10%. The scenario which worries me is that I think Mario Draghi and the leadership of the ECB have the capacity, whenever the Eurozone is getting close to crisis, to take it away from crisis by immediate interventions, even if they're only verbal, do whatever it takes, or particular purchases uh, are under the, uh, the sovereign wealth uh, debt uh, purchase. But I think if they simply try and fix it by QE and negative interest rates without more radical action, the Eurozone will be stuck for many years with slow growth, below target inflation, high unemployment, and rising political pressures. That's my most likely. I think you could well see a partial breakup within five years. Greece is not nearly out of its problems, and I think that problem is going to return to us this year. I'm not convinced that Italian government debt is sustainable in the long term, and that could come back as a problem. I place that as only 20% in the five years, but sadly, of course, if scenario two is where we reside, eventually that collapses into a breakup uh, as well. So I'm not optimistic, because I think the Eurozone needs the capability of thinking about monetary finance, but I don't think it's going to do it. And I'm sorry to end on that somewhat pessimistic point of view, but it is where my analysis takes me.